Hello, friends. Uh, I'm just going to wait for a couple of more attendees to join in. I can see a few are. Uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Nandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, the topic for today's webinar is how local organics recyclers in the US are weathering the pandemic. And uh, moderating this webinar is uh, Cole Rosengren. He's a lead editor at Type. Cole has moderated other webinars on Be Waste Wise. So please head to the video panel section if you haven't seen them. Cole is going to speak to Meredith Danberg Ficarelli. She's the executive director at Common Ground Compost and Marvin Hayes, who's a program manager at Baltimore Compost Collective. As usual, uh, this is going to be a fairly casual discussion. So we welcome questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A section. Please put your questions in there. While Cole has a structure initially based on the number of questions that comes in, he will pick them up and post them to the panelists. And please use the chat box to introduce yourselves. And if you have any comments for the panel based on what they're speaking. Over to you, Cole. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for being with us here today. And thanks to Meredith and Marvin for joining. Uh, no secret, these last two years have been quite tough for everyone, obviously, with the pandemic. Um, and recyclers have felt it quite a bit. You know, big shift in the waste stream during the lockdown period. A lot of folks have gotten sick, big disruptions in supply chain, everything under the sun. Um, and it's been hard even for the biggest organizations to weather that. And it's you know, particularly challenging for smaller folks and local folks to keep it going. And so we want to just check in with some leaders in the space here to hear what it's been like for them, what they're looking, looking toward this year, um, and, and hope it's useful to others that are working on you know, similar scale projects out there. So to start, um, Meredith, could you please give us a sense of just who Comic Ground Compost is, what you're up to in New York City, um, what the scale of the operation looks like, and then just sort of a quick recap of what the past almost two years of pandemic have been. And then we'll look ahead, you know, later in the program. But how's it been going so far? Quick recap. Sure thing, Cole. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Meredith Danberg Ficarelli. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited uh, about this discussion. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm the executive director of Common Ground Compost. We are a zero waste services company based in New York City. Um, I'll try to give the super quick zoomed out timeline. Uh, the company was founded in 2014 um, by my partner, Laura Rosenschein. Um, and she, uh, she started the company because she recognized a need for a variety of services, including zero waste consulting for businesses and micro scale organics collection and processing for small generators, because in New York City and really everywhere, I'm sure we'll talk about this more today, the smallest generators who might be small cafes, small restaurants, um, a preschool, uh, small offices, everybody generates food scraps, but it's not always enough to fill the size of a container that a truck comes to collect. And that's what micro hauling is all about. That's what micro scale processing theoretically is all about. Um, the company scaled, uh, we, we launched an events division the following year, so zero waste events. Um, I joined in 2015 and I became the executive director in 2017. And since then we've continued to scale. We've launched two additional divisions. Um, we've been doing education the entire time. So training, whether it's back of house, restaurant employees in English and Spanish. Ideally, unfortunately, I don't speak Korean or French or Albanian, which is a really important language for um, a lot of the, um, the janitorial staff that work in buildings. That um, language barrier can be a huge challenge, and it's so important to be able to talk to people, even if it's for five minutes, about the background of why what they're doing matters and why the rules that are in place, the bag colors, you know, the waste station infrastructure and co-locating bins, all of these things. You got to be able to talk to people to explain these things. Um, and we might talk a little bit later about a webinar series that we recently launched. This is all through our waste in the community division, um, which is our education and advocacy work. Um, and over the last few years, we've also been building software. So that's our fifth division. Um, and that is a, a waste operations focused platform. Uh, we're very excited about it. And it hasn't officially been announced because we're not entirely ready to launch yet. But um, those are the big things that we're working on. And I'll just briefly explain what we do when it comes to our organics collection program. We are a bike, a bike hauler. So we use um, 
Uh, yeah, and we use um, electric assist uh, cargo tricycles. Uh, they're made in Denver and Colorado here in the United States. Um, we, we obviously had them shipped across the country and we collect from what I explained earlier, small businesses, um, a few small cafes and small restaurants and a lot of, of commercial offices. Uh, so to speak to COVID, that was a huge challenge. We made the excellent decision in 2018 to pivot our services and to focus on these commercial office tenants who really, really wanted access to organics recycling services, but whose building staff, whose property manager or whomever it might be that manages waste operations in their building was not yet providing that service and wasn't willing to offer that service to one individual tenant within this building. So we built this sort of janitorial style organics collection service and um, January of 2020 was our best month of our entire company's history. Um, we have the charts to show it. And then February wasn't, obviously. Um, well, you know, we'll call it March, but uh, Q1 was great. And then Q2 wasn't. Um, and I can get into a bit more of that later, you know, talking about some of the kind of survival mechanisms and some of the pivots that we had to do. But that service has evolved over time. Initially, we were collecting by bike, and this was Laura, and then some people that we hired and some excellent haulers along the way. Um, initially, it was entirely human powered, then in 2018, 2019, through um, actually a prize, uh, a prize award from the US Composting Council, um, we were able to purchase our first electric assist vehicle, um, tricycle, like I mentioned. Initially, we were processing everything that we collected in a community garden um, on school property in the East Village of Manhattan, so downtown New York City, um, using uh, the Bokashi method, so fermenting those food scraps before um, trenching them underground. Uh, we evolved into using um, an aerated static pile bin, a two bin system. So we were trenching into the bin system on that Bokashi material. There was a fire in the garden. We were displaced for a while. Uh, our shipping container is still on the street um, three plus years later. Um, and now it, we our processing operation is, is on hiatus, but not forever. And we have been consolidating material that's being collected by a commercial waste hauler. So we consolidate into 64 gallon, which are you know the standard compost collection totes and a truck comes and collects that from us. And we pay a bill to that commercial waste hauling company and they bring the material um, through a transfer station in Queens, um, which is another thing that we can probably talk about is transfer station infrastructure and the disproportionate impact that it has on chronically disenfranchised and marginalized communities. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it'll come up again, but that material does end up going to a uh, commercial scale compost facility. Um, I feel like that was a really long overview, so I'll stop there um, and I'm excited to hear more. No, that's great, thank you. And there's plenty, plenty to unpack there. Um, sounds like quite, quite a journey so far. Um, Marvin, same on your end, just to give us a sense of the basics on Baltimore Compost Collective. Correct me if I'm wrong, you've been around a similar amount of time, right, you know, a, around that time period and working out of a community garden. Um, give us a little more on what you've been up to and how it's, you know, how you, how you were affected in early 2020. Hey, great, great, great grand rising to everybody. Uh, my name is Marvin Hayes, giving you a big welcome from Recycle More, Baltimore City. Uh, I'm, uh, I want to give you a disclaimer that I am contagious. I am a long hauler of compost fever and responsible for the composting pandemic in Baltimore City, me and my youth composters. Uh, we serve an amazing uh, community garden called the Filbert Street Garden, which if anybody follows me, I call the Wakanda of South Baltimore, where we don't make vibranium, but we do make leaf gold compost, and we do make goldenrod honey. Uh, this community garden is located in a food insecure food desert. Uh, where it takes my youth compost and other residents about a half an hour to get to a market. So we provide soil enhancer for 47 raised beds that our residents are able to grow fresh produce and fruits and vegetables. Uh, we hire youth from a local high school called Ben Franklin High School. We've had seven youth uh, all seven of our youth have uh, graduated from Ben Franklin High School. Uh, two have started their own business. Uh, 
One of them is still working. He graduated in 2021, Mr. Kenneth Moss. He started his own business called Kenneth Captures, just a kid with a camera. He has aspiration of being a National Geographic photographer uh, and taking pictures of soil from all around the world. So he, I have turned them into a snow saw, uh, loving compost and what it does for residents who live in a food insecure neighborhood. Uh, we are diverting about 3,000 pounds on a monthly basis from going into the landfills and incinerators. The garden which I serve is surrounded by a bunch of toxic. It has been a toxic depth and ground, uh, surrounded by two incinerators, one medical incinerator, one that burns trash. When you burn trash, it creates a chemical called carbon dioxide. When you burn trash, it causes methane gas, which is causing the residents in my neighborhood $55 million in health damages, causing one of the highest asthma and cancer rate. So we train youth and we go out about four different neighborhoods and we pick up the food scraps and we bring it back to the garden and we process it in our three bin system. We also do uh, Bakashi, which I had to put a little Marvin in it and we call it Be More Kashi. Uh, we have a beam, a compost reactor, uh, where we are diverting the uh, waste from our livestock. At the Filbert Street Garden, the reason why I call it the Wakanda of South Baltimore uh, is due to one of my favorite quotes from the Black Panther movie. In times of crisis, while the foolish build barriers, the wise build bridges. Uh, we turned this community garden about 11 years ago. It was a dumping ground. Uh, Jason Reed, who was the founder uh, galvanized community residents and created this community garden, which now is uh, a place where animals are rescued. We have uh, Nigerian miniature dwarf goats. Uh, we have 35 different breeds of chickens and waterfowl and ducks. Uh, we have the largest beehive in Baltimore City where we have 74 hives where we work with 311. So if they get a call for bees, we go out and rescue them and bring them back to the uh, garden and they help us take care of the garden. We are sustainable because we sell the garden, sell the honey to take care of all the maintenance in the garden to provide food for our livestock. Uh, so we're very sustainable. Um, we, uh, during COVID, we had to shift to a contactless drop off. Uh, we ultimately stopped service for about three months um, due to that we had youth and we did not want to uh, spread COVID uh, to our youth, uh, to any of our customers. Uh, so we got very creative and started a, a contactless drop-off where our residents would go to a local recreation center and drop off their compost. We would then take it back to the garden and process that to make soil enhancer for those residents um, who had those 47 raised beds and our greenhouse uh, there. Uh, currently, uh, we're back to curbside compost pickup. We have uh, we have expanded our program now. We serve Mount Washington, Federal Hill, Riverside, and we'll be open off a community drop off in Cedarcraft, uh, which will be a pilot where they will bring their uh, food scraps and drop those off. Um, we have had, uh, like I said, uh, not only are we diverting. Uh, food scraps from going into the landfills and incinerator, but we're giving you from a disenfranchised neighborhood an opportunity to learn small scale composting and then be able to uh, teach that to their peers and to the residents that are affected by incineration, knowing that compost is the alternative to incineration. Uh, our slogan at the Baltimore Compost Collective is uh, compost, learn so you don't have to burn. Education is the variant that we're pushing right now with compost fever. We're going to starve the incinerator because we know that they're going to keep it open, but we can divert that material. So we've been working with the Office of Sustainability, uh, DPW, Rockefeller Foundation, and NRDC to do training all around Baltimore City. I've been doing uh, home composting training. We've been training community gardens so they can do compost drop-off program. So we've been trying to be that compost caboose. We know that the caboose is in the back of the train, but the Baltimore Compost Collective wants to be that program that's going to push Baltimore City towards zero waste. Um, you know, as far as COVID, uh, me and my staff are just getting over uh, having 
uh, COVID. So it has been a challenge, but we are back. Uh, we do not want to spread. Uh, we had to shut down for one week, so we didn't want to spread uh, anything, uh, any of the Omicron uh, variant. The only thing that we want to spread is compost fever. So I apologize for the long overview, but we are busy causing a compost pandemic throughout Baltimore City. Uh, being a blessing to others is always a blessing. So thank you for this opportunity. No, you're good, man. I'm I'm happy to hear everyone's on the mend. Hopefully, with COVID, it sounds like you've both both organizations have had a real real run of it in these last couple of years and had to be pretty resilient. Um, you mentioned Marvin, you know, pivoting to do the contactless drop off, thinking of different ways to to handle it in the beginning. Meredith, um, going back to you, you said obviously the office business just decimated, right? My understanding is office um, attendance is still not back to 100 percent in you know Manhattan and other parts of New York City what what did that look like for you and kind of bring us up to now and you know how, how did you have to pivot and change services like Marvin did as well to keep up yeah so you know I, I'll speak to it from the compost collection um, side of our operation and then also from the company as a whole I'll, I'll start there um, you know I think partly chronological luck call it what you will the universe etc um, just before COVID hit we signed a contract with a commercial real estate company to be their um, organics focused zero waste consultant. So that contract started in January of 2020. Um, unexpectedly, obviously horrible timing for this um, commercial real estate portfolio and their 27 buildings in Manhattan to try to launch organics recycling in buildings that would suddenly not have almost any really except for the engineers and the essential building staff uh, population you know, occupancy uh, on site. Um, but, but we, we worked with them through the year and then, um, re-upped and actually increased that contract in 2021. So now, you know, we are there, um, hopefully long-term, um, at least medium-term, uh, zero waste consultants. Uh, so any of their tenants that need any help with, with anything that relates to recycling, um, any education, standard operating procedures, compliance assessments, waste auditing, uh, we're auditing all the buildings once a year. Um, so these are, you know, pretty large, you know, anywhere from 30,000 square feet to 2 million square feet sites. Um, so that contract, uh, was one of the things that kept, that kept us afloat, honestly. Um, so I think we were, we were really lucky that our, work from 2014 until just before the pandemic hit led us to be able to propose our services and win that contract. Um, so consulting and our consulting division was one of the one of the things that that helped us to continue um, to continue operating and to, to keep people employed. Um, admittedly, it didn't it didn't make ends meet. Uh, we're lucky to be in New York State um, where in addition to the federal loans that we were able to access to help cover payroll, um, the, the, the PPP Paycheck Protection Program, New York State also has, um, through the Unemployment Department of New York State, uh, they have um, a seasonal labor support program that they deployed for small businesses during COVID uh, to essentially allow them to access uh, funds to help them meet, meet uh, make ends meet with payroll. So we had to depend on that program as well. Um, and when it comes to our organics collection program, you know, we we've always had a few residential customers and some some food business customers. Again, mostly small cafes and small restaurants. But we had really really drilled down. We had almost a hundred office customers that we were collecting from um, throughout Manhattan. And all of them shut down. Uh, initially, a few of them, um, you know, said we thought it was going to be two weeks, right? We we were all kind of in the same boat. Um, some of them actually continued to support us. They basically said we want to support you as a local business. And for the for through the year, um, they continued to pay kind of an average of what they had been paying us. Sorry, my dog. Um, uh, for our services. Um, at contextually, what was happening in New York City at the time was obviously a budget crisis. And there are a lot of factors that went into that. And I'll just talk about the Department of Sanitation right now. I'm not going to talk about other city departments and what happened there and the allocation of funds that I think many people might disagree with um, within other city agencies. But specifically within the Department of Sanitation, 
um, they have they they defunded the entire residential organics collection program. So um, quick uh, zoom out for a second in New York City, the system, the waste collection system is split essentially right down the middle between um, commercial waste and residential waste. So the residential um, residential waste services are paid for by taxpayer dollars and the city is the one that's doing those collections of trash, of recycling, of organics in some cases. And I'll talk about that in a second. On the commercial side, it's an entirely private system. Um, so the residential program is the one that I'm talking about. And starting in about 2012, 2013, the city started to build access to organics recycling for residents. My husband joined the webinar for a second. Um, and uh, through through COVID, through you know 2020, that program continued to grow gradually. Um, more more neighborhoods were given access to these bins that they would use for their food scraps, and it was a curbside collection program. There was also um, funding available for drop off programs, which is how it all started. Um, New York City's organics collection program began really in the late 80s or early 90s with grassroots organizations that dropped bins on the Lower East Side Ecology Center. As far as I know, got this all started by putting, putting a couple bins in Union Square in the middle of Manhattan and people brought their food scraps and they brought that material processed it themselves into compost um, and used it uh, in, in lower Manhattan to improve soil quality and um, you know biodiversity and all these other things. Uh, those organizations like them continue to operate, receive some funding from the city. That all ended essentially. Um, it went from, I believe it was $31 million a year dedicated to specifically organics recycling in New York City, distributed between this uh, residential collection program that was run by the Department of Sanitation and what was called the New York City Compost Project, which were these small scale community based organizations that were receiving funding from the city to run their drop off programs, their collection operations and their processing. Um, that $31 million shrunk to 2.4 million, I believe. Um, the entire collection program ended and, and those small organizations didn't have access to funding either. And it was a, a huge problem. So nearly all access to organics recycling ended aside from what these scrappy, honestly, and no offense intended, were scrappy too, um, organizations were able to continue to do on their own. Um, there was a lot of advocacy. There's still um, advocacy around this is called the Save Our Compost Coalition. Um, you can find them on Instagram and they're still fighting to get access to get, um, essentially to get more funding for uh, community scale organics recycling to improve access. This was a major challenge even before COVID, um, who had access to organics recycling depended on where they lived, period. Um, if you, you know, if you had more resources and were more able to advocate, especially to your city councilors or what, what, whatever it might be, um, you had access to organics recycling or you were far more likely to have it than, than other neighborhoods that might not have, um, have had that, uh, you know, those opportunities. Um, and micro haulers have been kind of a part of this uh, ecosystem, um, you know, through this time. Um, specifically to tell our story here, uh, we also shut down for, um, I believe it was about three months to Marvin, I think, um, to maybe two months. Forgive me, my team is going to be shaking their heads, but I can't remember all these um, these details. But uh, we, you know, we stopped collecting from. Um, from all of our businesses and from our residents. Uh, very few of the businesses um, reopened, but a few months later we had pivoted, we launched our own drop-off program that was uptown, um, a pretty far bike ride from where we were located, but it was based on where there was already access. Um, the Lower East Side Ecology Center was able to keep a couple of their drop-offs open. Uh, and we didn't, there was no reason for us to provide a, yet another drop-off closer to where we are because they had it covered. Um, whereas up where our drop-off was on 107th Street, um, which is you know further, further uptown in Manhattan, uh, there was no access to organics recycling or at least very little, um, some in individual community gardens, et cetera. Uh, and the way we launched that program initially was by riding our trike up there once a week on Wednesdays, um, parking on a street corner outside a community garden that one of our team members was a part of from four to 6 p.m. every Wednesday. And we did that for a year. Um, and this was a, a you know, self-funded, we'll call it, um, Again, thanks to all of the support that we were receiving and from contributions, um, individuals that came and brought their food scraps, some of them gave us cash or Venmo every single week. And the, it was 
you know, our entire team participated. Uh, you know, I don't ride the trike, but I would show up and, and kind of help um, answer questions and make sure that people were masked and standing in line and respecting um, everyone for the most part, it was excellent. Um, and, you know, the, the energy was just um, indescribable. The, the way that people showed up, waited in line and talked to each other. You know, I haven't seen another person since I was here last week, or this is my one opportunity to be happy. <laughs> um, you know, I had, you know, giving people a reason to be outside um, and a way to, uh, a way to feel like they were connecting back with maybe what was already kind of an ethical or moral responsibility that they felt as an individual to try to reduce their footprint. Maybe it was something entirely new. Um, and that's maybe I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up this answer on this piece, um, and, and this might kind of speak to one of the questions that's in the Q&A, but I'm sure we'll get to that later. Um, we found a lot of people saying things like, and this is through webinars that we did, um, you know, this was, lockdown happened right before Earth Day, so we did a bunch of now only virtual webinars, um, zero waste education, how to compost at home, all of these things, and from folks who were waiting in the line to drop off their food scraps at our drop-off, um, I never knew how much waste I produced. I've I've been locked down at home and now everything that I touch and every all the waste that I generate is now within my space. People suddenly recognizing that maybe they're not going out and buying a coffee every day, but any of the material that they used to generate throughout an average day of commuting to work, being able to use street, you know, street cans, the, the cans in the subway, the cans in their office, stopping at the deli and using the bin on the corner. Um, all of that material was now within their home. And suddenly people were recognizing like, wow, I didn't know that I made this much trash before. Um, and I think, you know, seeing that, recognizing that and kind of like living with it made motivated more people to find ways to reduce and to find ways to divert. Um, and so we found, you know, a number of first time composters or first time organics recyclers, um, you know, participating in our drop off because they really wanted a way um, to give back or, or to engage. Um, and folks who brought three months worth of frozen food scraps to our drop off the first time it opened because they had, they were like, I don't freeze food anymore. I only freeze food scraps because I don't have any space for them. Um, people really, really care about this. And it, it like, it can be, you know, um, morally destructive to not be able to practice um, organics recycling, or at least the diversion of food scraps, uh, because we know once we start, we know how much value exists in the whatever it might be um, that we're that you know banana peel. If we'll use the most common one there, um, so I think that's a bit of the story. We did pivot and launch a res. We relaunched and scaled our residential collection program. Um, a simple five gallon bucket model. It was contactless as well. Um, I feel like a lot of the organics recyclers and small scale haulers um, did that. They pivoted from um, you know, a standard business service to a four or five gallon bucket collecting from residents and trying to be contact free. Uh, not easy, um, much less profitable. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a higher cost, usually less dense. Um, so there's there's a lot more challenge. There are a lot more challenges um, sometimes associated with the residential services. The drop-off model was excellent, but it was challenging for us to run because it was so far away from where we were located. Um, and initially we were riding all that material back down um, about a hundred blocks to our community garden. Um, and then we started as, as it grew, it, it was just a, an increase, um, almost exponential increase in the amount of material that we collected. Um, up to, it was about four 64 gallon totes, um, per every, every Wednesday, which is about a thousand pounds. Um, if we're, if we're assuming that each tote is 250 pounds and they were, we were standing there chopping the material to make sure that it was as densely packed as possible. Um, and we were paying the bill to a commercial hauler that was collecting that material. Um, and the community garden was, was hosting those empty compost bins for the week until the next event. Um, so we did stop bringing the trike um, because we didn't need it. Uh, we weren't able to haul. We can only fit two of those totes on the trike. So we weren't able to haul all the material back. Um, and it just made sense cost-wise for us to have our team members there who are being paid for their time. Um, but just to kind of ride the subway there and then ride the subway back home. Um, and, you know, thanks to all, I don't, I assume none of the folks are, are in this webinar who participated and came to that drop-off event, but, um, you know, you all said that it was like helping to keep you alive. It was helping to keep us alive too. It was really meaningful for us to be able to, you know, continue that 
um, direct connection, even if it wasn't our exact community, um, to a community of folks who who obviously like really cared and really wanted to make this happen. And we've heard stories like this from from all over. So, yeah. Well, that's really heartening to hear. No, I any any sliver of hope or human contact, especially in the early days, was hard to come by and important. Um, and for folks who aren't familiar with New York, you know, the situation Meredith outlined, it's still not 100% back, right? A lot of the, the funding has been restored, but the curbside organics program is opt-in now. It was not citywide to begin with, you know, and it's, so it's still slow going. There's some drop-off bins, um, but there, it's still not all that easy to recycle organics unless you're paying for a subscription service or you can get to the drop-off site. And so there's ongoing work to be done there to say the least. Um, Getting to one of the questions, and, and thank you for submitting a question. Others, please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A tab. Um, you touched on it a little bit, Meredith, and I'll kick this to either of you. Sounds like, you know, people being home, especially in the beginning, there was a larger quantity of food waste, you know, that would track with kind of national stats we're seeing with waste just in general, you know, double digit percentage increases in residential waste volumes in the early days. Um, kind of bringing us up to today and looking ahead, does it feel like, is that going to stick? Are you still seeing to either of you higher volumes of residential food scraps coming in? How's the quality of that? Or, you know, maybe presumably new people are getting engaged. Are they following your guidelines? How, how's the contamination look in there? Sort of what? How, how Marvin, go for it and I'll fill in. Uh, yes, we're still seeing an increase in the amount of waste that we're collecting because people are home. The Omicron variant has shut down schools in Baltimore City, so a lot of people are home. Uh, COVID for the Baltimore Compost Collective was one of my favorite sayings. A setback is just a setup for a comeback. Uh, when we initially had to close down for uh, those three months, our constituents still supported, still paid their monthly subscription to keep us up and operating, which came to our contactless drop-off program. Um, our contactless drop-off program gave us a relationship with our customers. Before we would just pick up their, their uh, five gallon bucket and take it back to the garden and process it. Uh, we didn't have a lot of interaction. So it became an opportunity to, for people to get out the house, to exercise, to walk their dogs. Uh, my customers got very creative and came up with carpools, carpools, where they would collect all of the buckets on that block and take turns uh, once a week dropping those products off. So they became very, very creative. Uh, then we were able to expand and move that contactless drop off to another uh, community. So it has allowed us to actually expand our service um, and be able to educate uh, during COVID, I also was a 2000 and COVID-19 OSI fellow, uh, Oper uh, Open Society Institute. And my goal for that project was to increase the knowledge of small scale composting to youth that are in the affected area where this with uh, emphasis on anti-incineration. And uh, my goal was to bring youth into the garden, but schools had shut down and went virtual. So I said, I'm gonna do virtual tours. And throughout that, I was able to tour, uh, to do tours for over 2000 youth through K through 12, through virtual. So it, it allowed me to uh, get into an area that I wasn't familiar with, with uh, going virtual and getting on uh, Instagram and, uh, you know, uh, TikTok and all of these things to do education. Um, you know, when, when I do my composting workshop, I ask my youth two questions. One, what are your favorite fruit and vegetable? Because of course those can be uh, composted. And I ask them, have any of them been affected by uh, asthma or cancer? In the schools that surrounded in my community, uh, when I ask that question, 95% of the students raise their hand and have asthma or cancer or their grandma or papa or mama have been affected by asthma or cancer. The teacher goes in her bag and pulls out a whole big freezer Ziploc bag full of inhalers. So we have a problem. So it was so amazing to me to still be able to educate. The only way we're gonna get out of this is through education. So COVID allowed me to be able to expand because youth that couldn't come, a lot of uh, schools don't,
don't have budget to give uh, to go out for field trips. So now it allows me to bring them to the garden virtually. No, it's nothing like grabbing those red wiggler worms and that gorgeous black humus and putting your fingers tips through it and feeding the goats and feeding the chickens. But I was able to bring that to them virtually. So we're continuing virtual tours to educate about small scale composting with an emphasis on anti incineration because that affects the uh, the city that I serve. They put these in poor neighborhoods, but the wind doesn't segregate or discriminate. So we have um, increased our capacity. Uh, we we uh, before the pandemic we were collecting probably uh, 400 pounds a week. Now we're at 700 to 800 pounds diverting it. And I know that's not a small uh, uh, a large amount. But every little bit counts, and it is showing that Baltimore City can do curbside compost pickup. So I am pushing Baltimore City to do curbside pickup. Also, a great thing that came through this, DPW, the Department of Public Works, caught compost fever and now has community drop-off sites at all of their drop-off locations. So it has been a great thing that this compost fever and compost pandemic that is spreading throughout Baltimore City has allowed residents who normally can't afford a collection service like myself. Um, I'm still struggling with trying to make it convenient for people who can get to a drop-off location to get funding to put in some of these dis disfranchised neighborhoods so they can have an opportunity to divert some of their organic waste and learn to compost and with an emphasis of recycling because both of those go hand in hand. So we are promoting that you have three waste stations at your home, one for your waste, one for your compost, and one for your recyclable materials. And that's how we're gonna to get to zero waste. Gotcha. No, uh, that sounds like things are really picking up. Um, Meredith, what is, what's your quick take on that? It sounds like volumes are coming up. You're moving into residential as you're getting new people doing it. Are they, is, is it good quality? Is it nice material that you're getting? Yeah, um, it's a great question. The, you know, Cole, you spoke to the volume increases. So for sure, it's there. Uh, they're, they're, as people were at home, the waste was redistributed from commercial spaces um, back to, to residential spaces. Um, I think, you know, quality, I, I, I don't actually think there was that much of a difference. There's always a little bit of contamination in the material that we collect, but as a micro hauler and as a small scale, you know, small business, honestly, um, you know, we have a direct, we have a direct line to whoever it is that we're collecting from. Granted, as Marvin was, was saying, you know, this is a contactless pickup. So it's not like we were standing and grabbing a bucket from someone and able to communicate directly with them. But um, if we, if we were to find aluminum foil or whatever it might be in a bin, we would email the customer and talk to them about it, make sure they know that, that doesn't belong there. And we do that for residents and for businesses. Um, in some of our in some of our larger commercial accounts for you know some of these office spaces we have a contamination fee and we'll charge them if they have regular contamination i actually don't know if we have ever actually levied that fee but it's in our service agreement um, usually a couple warnings do the trick and retraining is really important um, there's turnover especially through covid our expectation is that as offices reopen um, at least what we're asking them to do is to invite us in to talk to them again um, it's highly likely that a lot of the people that work there weren't there before um, and because at least our country our entire country does not not have a culture of recycling. There are certainly some pockets where it's super normal. I grew up recycling. I'm from the Boston area, um, but there are millions of people, hundreds of millions of people who have never recycled in America. Um, not an aluminum can, not a cardboard box, and definitely not a banana peel. So we have to start from scratch. Um, and it's one of the really challenging things that I talked to our business customers about, you know, they're frequently, at least even now before offices reopen, we are hearing from businesses asking us to help them launch organics recycling so that when they do come back to the office, it's already in place. I super support that model. Give us a call. We're here to help you. Um, it's a really good time to do it. Uh, as people, you know, if they've been away for two years, um, they should come back to new systems. They are already going to come back to new systems with uh, the health and safety standards that are going to be in place. Um, and, you know, the, the re-education is, is really important. Um, the messaging is super important. And what we tell businesses is that it might not be fair that it's their responsibility to start 
at the foundation of explaining um, you know, material literacy to people, helping them understand what things are made of. You know, you have a ceramic coffee mug, you think uh, that's reusable, you could totally throw it in your recycling bin. Absolutely not. <laughs> Marvin might have other suggestions here, but what I do with all my broken ceramics, I crush them up and I use them in my pot, my potted plants and in my garden. Um, Cause you can't put ceramics unless it's in a ceramic recycling program, which most people don't have access to unless maybe you're a potter. Um, forgive me, I'm not a potter. Uh, <laughs> um, right, understanding that diff that materials belong together and other materials don't. Um, and with food scraps, you know, it's it's about keeping them separate so that everything else stays clean and everything else stays dry. Um, in offices, we're seeing a definite increase in demand for accepting certified compostable products. Mm -hmm. um, we're not probably going to get too deep into into greenwashing and some of the challenges associated with whether something is certified compostable, labeled as compostable, labeled as plant-based, made from plants, renewable. Um, I won't swear, but it makes me want to because it's incredibly <laughs> frustrating. Um, and it's not people's fault. Uh, it's not your fault. If you're holding a fork that says it's made from plants and you don't know what to do with it, probably put it in the trash. That's probably the answer. Unless it has, at least in the States, a BPI, Biodegradable Products Institute certified logo on it. Most composters, I'd say nearly all of them aren't gonna want that that item. Um, Cedar Grove is another, you know, um, site that certifies it there it's limited right now um and that's where we've seen contamination um a lot of contamination is in the food in rather not in food businesses but in offices that um you know are trying to do the right thing just don't understand what they're holding um so so that that information is really important and and honestly um informing the the purchasing division or informing the people who are making purchasing decisions um is really essential and then i'll just plug it's no safer, and I'm not a scientist, so take this with a grain of salt. It's no safer to use um, a, a single use disposable plastic fork than it is to use a metal fork that you can wash. Um, that plastic fork, if it's single use wrapped in another piece of plastic, someone else still touched the other piece of plastic that that fork is wrapped in. And it's no safer than the metal fork that's in the drawer. Um, so we're always pushing for reusables, mugs, plates, bowls, et cetera. Um, and I know this is quite a tangent because Kathleen probably uses reusable bowls in her kitchen and she's asking about residential material, but um, yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> now that's helpful and you're right. My gosh, yeah, we could easily have a whole nother hour on compostables and labeling and all that. and. Yet another chain, at least in my household, that we do more takeout and every weekend it's this game of what the heck do I do with this packaging? You know, they say it's compostable, it's not, it definitely doesn't go in their cycle. Man, a lot of times it just goes in the trash and goes off to the incinerator, you know, which is- There a are a couple, sorry for interrupting, there are a couple yeah. operations that have launched since COVID that, you, that are reusable takeout container programs. Um, so people can look those up. There are a few of them in New York um, and they're popping up all over the place. There's one that started in Portland quite some time ago that's, that's continued to expand. Um, so, so I do think that there's a, there's a huge opportunity there. The challenge is scale. Um, it's incredibly expensive to run a program like that unless it's support. It, there should be, these should be city supported programs. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. There, there's a lot there, and that's something I'm I'm hoping to learn more about this year too. Um, this Cole, I'm on the uh, piggyback piggyback sure. a little bit. Um, in Baltimore, we are passing legislation. Um, we have stopped plastic bags, but we are stopping one use plastics. Those mm. shouldn't even be trash in the first place. They should be bad. We should not be using them. We also are promoting legislation that manufacturers it should be clear on their products, whether it's composable or it's waste or it's recyclables. Uh, one great thing I did with contaminants was I did a lot of lunch and learns for my co uh, commercial customers, where I did a lunch and learn, told them what goes in to their uh, compost, what goes into their container to collect their composable. I did a lot of circle ups. Um, at the drop off sites, we made sure that we had signage. Also, my youth composters, youth ambassadors, youth compost ambassadors would be at those sites. And if they saw stickers, oh, those stickers, 
uh, they would uh, bring it to the customer attentions. We also would send emails out to anybody. And I love to have a fee for contaminants. So I'm definitely going to pick up that uh, practice as well. But, uh, you know, we do reminders and we, you know, through education, a lot of our customers are very, very knowledgeable about what goes into that compost. And when we don't do the bags because we don't want any PFAs inside of our uh uh, Black Gold at Filbert Street Garden. Um, so uh, that is a challenge for us as well. Mm -hmm. No, that, I think that's helpful advice for everyone about how, how they can model their programs. Um, something else I want to make sure we touch on, you both have kind of referenced it, but to talk about it more directly is sort of where possibly all the, the renewed attention to environmental justice in the last couple of years, does that help bring awareness to what you're doing? And are you seeing any kind of changes in how your operations are being perceived and for folks watching others please fill in but you know Meredith referenced in New York obviously there's a lot of transfer stations there was a law passed a few years ago to uh, the waste equity law to, to limit capacity in some of those transfer stations and overburdened areas um, but still there you know there's an incinerator across the river in Jersey there's still a lot of waste equity and environmental justice concerns in New York Baltimore is Marvin referenced you got the medical waste the Curtis Bay and then the uh what are they called now wind waste innovations the uh yes we injure neighbors that's what it stands for we injure neighbors yes they are trying to rename but they still are Bresco wheel the incinerator they injure neighbors they're trying to rebrand um they are hiring people uh to do recycling uh, pick up and putting roll offs out, but that is going right back to the incinerator and not being uh, recycled, but being burned and causing $55 million in health damages for the residents of Baltimore City. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with all that, you know, we got the president talking about it. You both got uh, new mayors uh, in your cities. Baltimore is a little recent, but still new. What does that change anything for the landscape? Do you think you will get any? different city support or will this help raise awareness for people about why it should be recycling organics that maybe the tie-in with obviously organics you know being a major contributor to climate change when they end up in a disposal site does that change the landscape at all for what you two are doing these days yes i, I think it's a lot more uh awareness on compost and hand baltimore city like i said we have been working diligently with dpw um they have created uh, a compost drop-off programs at their drop-off sites. They also are doing home composting training, which I was one of the trainers for their composting, uh, home composting workshops. And they're giving free garden earth systems to residents of Baltimore City who would like to do home composting. So if you attend the home composting workshop, you get a free, free garden home composting uh, uh, composting unit, which is enclosed in Baltimore City, we have a big urban rabbit problem. So we don't re uh, recommend open composting. Uh, we want enclosed composting. And the great thing about the green art garden system, you can use quarter inch hardware cloth and stakes so that you won't have an urban rabbit problem. Uh, we know that mice can fit through anything bigger than a number two pencil. So if you're doing home composting, make sure you use foam and steel wool to make sure you don't have any holes. And that way you don't have to, uh, you know, compost gets a bad rap that it is, uh, it causes odors and causes rodents. But if you do it correctly, and that's why it's so great to have the Institute for Local Self-Reliance to train us and give us all the best practices so we won't encounter uh, those problems. And, you know, we've been doing training for community gardens. So we've been setting up three bin systems and all community gardens starting community drop off programs. So I think we're in a great place. Um, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, we won't be brought to the table. So at the Baltimore Compost Collective, I'm making my own table. I'm increasing composting. I'm looking for a site to increase. Um, I'm not waiting for the city to create a large scale facility. I'm going to show the city what a mid-sized compost facility will look like run by youth. Uh, I'm going to turn uh, hustlers into haulers. I'm going to create opportunities for uh, uh ex-offenders who are master gardeners who don't even get to eat their food that they grow in those institutions. I'm going to have them come to the garden, be able to get uh, a job and then be able to train youth how to grow commercial food that they can then sell to the residents for low economical prices. So I think we're in a great place. Um, 
in having this uh, composting pandemic happening in Baltimore, we are increasing, we are working, we have a new, a new DPW director that's coming from Oakland, and he's going to bring uh, his compost variant from uh, from Oakland, where they are doing curbside pickup. They have been doing curbside pickup since the 90s, so we're so far behind, uh, so we're hoping that he brings all of his best practices from Oakland and put a little Baltimore in it and that we have curbside compost pickup so that it's accessible to everybody, not depending on your area or your financial status, but it's accessible to everyone. Well, that's exciting to see what happens there. Um, Mary, the same for you. you know, what does the landscape feel different? I guess, and not to steal your thunder here, but you know, the um, one of your former colleagues who helped fund the Micro Hours Trade Association, she's now a city council member, right? And is chair of the city council. Sandy. Team. Sandy Nurse. Yep. Yeah. What's going yeah. on? What feels different now in New York. Oh, what feels different? Um, we do have a new mayor. Uh, you know, where funding for the Department of Sanitation uh, was slashed, funding for the NYPD was not slashed. It went the other way. Um, so, uh, we do have, um, the most diverse city council ever, which is really exciting. Um, a lot of women, a lot of people of color, including, like you said, Sandy nurse, whose background was in founding DK rot, which is a Brooklyn based, um, bike powered youth employing micro hauler. Um, they, they make compost, um, in community gardens. They now have multiple, Sites, excellent organization, also a co-founding member of the Micro Haulers and Processors Trade Association, which I forgot to mention, um, Sandy and Renee Pepperone, who's the other co-founder um, of BK Rot, and um, Ceci Pineda, who has left BK Rot, but at the time was the executive director. Um, the, the four of us through lockdown um, worked together to launch the Micro Haulers and Processors Trade Association in New York City, um, which... Uh, it's a challenge to run a trade association and also have a full-time um, business to run, but um, the idea is really to represent the interest and, um, you know, hopefully advocate for growth in, in the industry. Um, yeah, I think we're hoping to see uh, a continued or maybe renewed effort in New York City to um, stand behind uh, what was a zero waste by 2030 goal. Um, that, that has existed for years, but um, we'll say was deprioritized. Um, uh, so we hope to, to see more of that. Um, I do think that, you know, an, an interest in um, funding or supporting and improving access to land um, for the, the small scale zero waste services businesses that include micro haulers and processors um, is of interest, um, I'd say within New York City's city council, knowing that Sandy is there. Um, these businesses are almost all run by, by women, by people of color, um, immigrants, minorities. Uh, you know, this is an incredibly diverse industry, not just in New York City, really across, across the country. You know, Marvin and I are part of, he mentioned this, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance runs the Community Composter Coalition. Um, I sit on the steering committee for that uh, operation. And it's a, it is a, essentially a digital community at this point. Um, we have had physical forums in the past, but because of COVID, we haven't been able to meet. Um, it's mostly uh, organizations from the United States, but there are international members as well. And these are active organizations that, co that consider themselves to be community composters. They are haulers, they are processors. Um, and these are organizations that are doing this work on the ground. Um, I'll also, I'm gonna drop a link into the chat uh, because we, we did briefly talk about the environmental justice aspect here. Um, Common Ground Compost has launched a 10 part webinar series that just started last week, um, focused on the intersection of waste and climate justice. Um, and so every, every part of the series is a different topic. Uh, you can see all the topics um, there at that link that I just shared. And we're asking for contributions to help to support um, Jesse and this division in the research that they've been doing to be able to launch this incredible um, series. A lot of this information kind of isn't really accessible right now. And um, all of the events will be available online afterwards. Um, so stay tuned and kind of keep visiting that, um, that link to, to get updates. Um, and yeah, we, we've seen renewed interest, I'll say. I do think that through this whole like living at home with their trash 
piece, people have begun to open their eyes a little bit. Like, where does my waste usually go? Um, and we've we've had a lot of uh, interest in some of these webinars and lunch and learns that we provide that are focused on on this intersection. Um, you know, the the impact that waste management has on communities of color, um, how to how to reduce waste at home, um, all of these things, and you know, we're obviously here for it. Well, it's great to hear. Knowing that and that looks like a very very strong series. There's a lot of good content. I encourage folks to check that out. Um, we're heading into our final five minutes, and I want to save a few minutes at the end to both kind of hear some departing remarks from both of you, but I, we also have some questions coming in. So let's do kind of a lightning round here, and anyone feel free to jump in. First up, um, Kathleen's curious if there was a shift in demographics in terms of age of participants or you know, any, anything to call it in terms of <clears throat> changes and who was participating in the last couple of years. Um, quick thoughts from either of you on that. Meredith, if you could speak a little bit, and I'll go after you. Sure. Um, it's been everyone. You know, I think it, at our at the drop off that we launched, it did trend um, either a, a little bit older, so folks who are maybe over sixty, and then a, a little bit younger, so maybe folks that were between, let's call it thirty and forty, younger. What? what how do I define these things? Um, you know. I'm not really sure, to be honest. I haven't done the research to be able to speak to this directly. I do think that it, there's been interest across the spectrum, um, but I, I think that uh, I think that it it has trended a bit more into like the mid to late twenties and above. Um, and then I think there are a lot of young folks who are really interested in this because they've absorbed this from a young age, recognizing the climate crisis that we're in and recognizing that the issues that let's call it an older generation have left us with are now their problem. Um, it, it just makes sense to young folks that this is the way to do it. They just don't have access. Um, you know, so I think, uh, yeah, that that's kind of my perspective on that one. That's good to know. And Marvin, I'll, we'll wear in this other question too, because <clears throat> excuse me, you touched on a little bit before that you do education in school. You know, what are you seeing younger people getting engaged and what what role do you think you know school education plays? Is that the foundational place to start? Yeah, so we're trying to pass current legislation right now that uh, a lot of the, uh, from Baltimore City school system, a lot of their waste will be composted, will be diverted. So we're working on passing legislation that uh, uh, in Baltimore County, we have haulers that are taking the waste away from Baltimore County schools. So we're gonna take the best practices. Once again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We're gonna take the best practices from Baltimore County, incorporate a little bit of Baltimore City, um, continue to um, not only make composting accessible in Baltimore City public schools, but provide a recycling curriculum that will have an emphasis on composting. And I'm finding that a lot of the schools that I've worked in now wanna have composting systems uh, and gardens in their schools. So we are moving forward. Um, you know, uh, the composting uh, fever um, through education has really, really uh, allowed us to be able to expand uh, the knowledge of small scale composting to areas who didn't have a lot of opportunity to learn, to know about where their trash goes, what happens to it and how it affects the residents of Baltimore City. So uh, through education, we have had big interest to start uh, three bench systems and uh, K through 12 schools here in Baltimore City. So we're so um, excited about that. Um, we know that uh, education has to start out with our children. They are the future environmental justice leaders. So we educate them. Our work will continue um, and we'll be able to see a uh, cleaner, greener Baltimore City. Awesome. We look forward to seeing more of that. Um... Well, thank you again to everyone who joined and thanks for you both for participating. As in sort of our final couple minutes, I'll kick it to each of you. What, any just general advice you'd give to folks who want to emulate what you've been doing with their own operation or support something like what you're doing in their own city or town? Any, any thoughts on a hopeful note for hopefully 2022, more to come? We'll start. Probably what I'd say, um, a lot of, well, with a grain of salt, um, co you know, composting using public land for organics recycling is banned in some places. So be careful, but also um, we're not we're not setting batteries on fire, right? We're recycling food scraps into a soil amendment. 
Um, we're, we're improving soil health. We're increasing water retention, um, you know, biodiversity, all of these really, really essential things. Uh, speak to your council people if you don't already have access to these things and just get started. There are so many people who say, you know, I really wanna try this. I don't really know where to start. It's like, if you if you already know that you have a couple neighbors who are interested in paying you to pick up their food scraps so you can compost them in your backyard, just do it. Like get just, that's how we all got started. I, you know, I can't speak to exactly Marvin's origin stories here, but um, that's how most of the community scale operations uh, launched. And um, your enthusiasm is what your community needs. Awesome. Marvin, any, any quick parting thoughts yeah. from you? I would say partnerships are so important. Um, use all of your avail available resources. Don't try to invent the wheel. Find someone that's doing similar to what you're trying to do in your community and take their best practices and put a little bit of your community into that to make sure it fits for your community. Um, I know I'm not gonna be able to shut down an uh, incinerator all by myself and uh, create curbside composting for Baltimore City, but together, and once again, uh, partnering and educating your council members uh, and the uh, uh, powers to be in your communities are uh, where it starts because a lot of people are just sending that stuff down to the incinerator because they don't know about compost and people aren't recycling in Baltimore City in certain areas because they didn't have a recycling uh, curriculum in their school. They weren't exposed to it. So we must make sure we have proper signage up. Don't set people up to fail. Don't provide a big 65 gallon uh, trash can to throw all your waste in when you're trying to promote recycling. Uh, you know, when you recycle and compost, um, you only need a five gallon container for your waste. So if we reuse and repurpose those materials, so I would say continue to educate, uh, get great, uh, get, uh, make sure that you are trained properly so that you are composting using all the proper practices. Uh, rely on uh, programs like Institute for Lo Local Self-Reliance that's been doing this work for years and knows all the best practices and creating this dynamic where they put all the compost together and all you got to do is put in a question and you'll have uh, a thousand responses back from different people who've been doing it the way that uh, is effective for their community. So once again, we're going to compost, we're going to learn so we don't have to burn, starve the incinerator, feed the soul, and feed the community. Awesome. Great advice. Well, thank you again, both. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks to Be Wastewise for hosting us. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Meredith and Marvin. It was a really great conversation. And uh, the webinar will be up on our website. We'll have a recording of the webinar up on our website in a couple of weeks for those who want to maybe share the link. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good day. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you're at. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.